and welcome to today's Premier Advisor Live. My name is Shomi Saha. I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy at Premier, and I'm located in Washington, D.C. Our Advisor Live webinar today will focus on a summary of the recent USP 797 and 795 compounding standard revisions that were released on June 1st. 2019 and are anticipated to go into effect on December 1st, 2019. So in today's Advisor Live, Annie Lambert, the Director of Performance Partners at Premier, as well as Chris Jones, the Director of Pharmacy Automation and Technology at Premier, will provide a summary of the final USP 795 and 797 revisions, describe the potential impacts to healthcare organizations, and share available resources to ensure compliance. So today's webinar will be recorded, and you'll be able to watch the recording by visiting the newsroom section of Premier.com later this week, or on the Premier News and Announcements Premier Connect community. Also, we will share via email a link directly to the recording once it is available, typically about 48 hours after the live recording. We've set aside an hour for today's event, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the program. You can submit a question at any time throughout today's webinar by using the Q&A space on the left-hand side of your screen. There will also be an opportunity to verbalize questions at the end of the call, and we will notify you of what those prompts will be at the end. From an agenda perspective, we're going to kick off with an overview of USP compounding standards, and then deep dive the revisions to 797 and 795, and finish off with an outline of all of the premier resources that are available to you to assist with compliance with the revisions. And finally, also leave plenty of time for Q&A. So before we kick off, I do want to note that Premier did advocate for a delay in implementation of the 797 revisions, noting that understanding release on June 1st and implementation on December 1st of the same year was going to be rather difficult, given the proposal as they related to BUD dates as well as environmental monitoring. But unfortunately, our request for that delay was not heard, and USP is moving forward with the December 1st, 2019 implementation date. The good news, however, is that Premier has a wealth of resources, both from a subject matter expert perspective, such as Chris and Annie, who you'll hear from today, as well as several resources on GPO contracts and consulting services to help ensure that our members get the most up-to-date information, get it firsthand as soon as possible, and that we're also here with you throughout this process to help you be as effective as possible in ensuring that you're compliant by that December 1st date. And as the lawyer in the room, I also have to take a moment to remind everyone that the content we're providing today is intended to be informational and for discussion purposes, and is not intended to be an official interpretation of USP and its implementing regulations. I will also say that Obviously, the USP revisions are very detailed and very complicated, and we, as you are, are continuing to make our way through them. So we're still working through the details, but obviously wanted to get as much information to you as we could sooner rather than later. So with that, I want to take a moment to introduce today's speakers to you. So Annie Lambert is our Director of Performance Partners with Premier and is located out of Tacoma, Washington. Annie's actually um, gracious enough to join us today, even though she's about to get on an airplane. So um, we do apologize for any minor background noise that you may be hearing during the presentation. And then Chris Jones is our Director of Pharmacy Automation and Technology and located out of Charlotte, North Carolina. So it is my honor to introduce um, Annie and Chris and to turn things over to Annie for the next section. So Annie? Great. Thanks so much, Shomi, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I know this is really a, a hot topic, and uh, as Shomi said, we are all trying to figure this out, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to share a few uh, pearls that will direct your uh, research and readiness plans uh, moving forward. Um, so first, just a little background on uh, the USP compounding standards. Um, Shomi, go ahead to the next slide. Great, thanks. So um, the USP compounding standards are, there are 
four standards in total. Um, today we'll really be covering 795 and 797 primarily. Um, as you know, USP 800 has been out uh, since 2016. And then there's this new chapter, uh, 825, that addresses radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're not going to cover that today. Um, if there's interest uh, in learning more about that, we can um, do some more um, presentations on that later. But um, there's so much to cover with 795 and 797 that we're really going to focus on those two. Um, Hopefully most of you on the call know uh, that 795 is about non-sterile compounding. Uh, 797 addresses the sterile compounding safety standards. Then 800 covers hazardous drugs. As I mentioned, 825, so radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, next slide. Um, you probably have seen this, this graphic before as well, that USP has provided uh, just a refresher of the timeline. Um, we are you know, now at June uh, 13th, so just a few, few days after the publication of uh, the 795 and 795, 797 excuse me, updates. Um, I think many of us were wondering if they were going to actually honor that timeline, and so I'm really pleased that they did, um, which still gives us just about six months to get ready to implement uh, all of those standards. Um, and that official date uh, is the USP official date. I think the million dollar question, which I'm not sure anybody has an answer to yet, is who is going to enforce and when are they going to enforce. And even in the, the standards they released uh, and in the FAQs, USP was very clear that they are not the enforcing body for these standards. They are merely publishing the regulations. Okay, thanks, so many, uh, Next slide. So um, first we're actually going to cover 797 because I think it has a little bit more uh, in depth and um, has a little more, especially for our um, hospital-based members. Um, and actually before I go on to that, I do want to acknowledge uh, also on the line uh, we have Jennifer Valentine from our Innovatix team um, who services primarily non-acute members and uh, she has some experience in 795 and 800 uh, as well. So uh, she'll be there for if you need to and sterile compounding. Um, so overall. Uh, just some, some general information, you've probably noticed that the chapter structure uh, has changed a little bit and um, it is a little easier to follow, kind of following in the, the footprint of USP 800 and actually both, uh, so all three, 800, 797, and 795 are now in a um, more similar format, um, which I appreciate. And um, there's lots of summary tables that uh, help really focus in on what some of the important points are. Um, so I appreciate USP doing that as well. Um, they've also brought in a, a little clearer definition of compounding, um, which is interesting uh, from a, a federal level to have that. Some states I know have different definitions, um, so that'll be something to pay attention to. Um, you probably are aware that the um, categories for compounding, um, the low, medium, and high risk, are, have gone away, and now we have Category 1 and Category 2, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, and then many of the other, um, much of the other content of 797 is really, I think, clarifying what should be current practice, um, but there are a few, few points that, that direct us towards the um, current good manufacturing practices. and. Um, uh, there are some notes of that in the chapter itself, and uh, if it, it gives you some hint of the direction that the regulatory environment is heading in general, um, that's, that's something to pay attention to. Um, and then something a little different that they have done this year, or this with this revision, is clarifying really what is in scope for the chapter and what is out of scope. There's lots of a very frequent question comes up is, is administration or once the product is um, given to the patient, is that included? Uh, and that is clearly out of scope of the chapter. Um, hazardous drugs uh, have been, you know, removed. And um, uh, from the particular part of you know, the 797 used to address hazardous drugs, but now obviously that's all covered in USP 800. Um, and then radiopharmaceuticals, there's that entire chapter for that. 
Um, one area that I'm still trying to figure out, and maybe you are too, is that uh, they clearly said that it's out of scope to uh, have when things are prepared per approved labeling. So I'm not, I, I'm still trying to figure that out if it means um, you're just following the directions in the package insert, if that means you don't have to follow all of the standards. Um, so if you have questions about that, I'm right there with you. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I really wanted to highlight some of the facility um, impacts. There's, there's uh, not a whole lot of changes for the expectations in a full clean room suite, um, but they really defined uh, either you're compounding in a clean room suite with hood, a uh, buffer room, and an ante room um, with minimum uh, positive pressure and air change requirements. Uh, and if you're not in one of, in something that's meeting all of those criteria, then you're in a segregated compounding area. And um, I think probably a lot of facilities are in sort of an in-between place and trying to get their facility up to those standards of meeting a clean room um, definition. Uh, and then there are plenty of places that maybe have an isolator or a glove box or uh, even a laminar flow hood in um, a designated area that doesn't really meet all of those standards. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight on the clean room side is that uh, they, they took out some of the really uh, prescriptive rules about where a sink must be placed. And so that really gives or, uh, organizations a lot more opportunity to, def to define their hand hygiene and garbing protocols based on their particular layout. Um, there was a lot of confusion in the prior chapter uh, version about how uh, the exact order that uh, personal protective equipment should be applied. And um, it turns out that, that the order it's applied is really dictated by your physical layout. So um, it's nice that they allowed some more flexibility for that, for us to do the right thing. On the segregated compounding side, um, there's also a requirement for sinks. Uh, they need to be at least a meter away from the hood, uh, which is that PEC, the primary engineering control. Um, and it's possible that that's a, a number that some regulatory body would really hone in on. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight here too that um, uh, if you have a hood that's in a, a facility that's now called a segregated compounding area, whether you called it something else before or not, um, I, I know a lot of facilities had glove boxes or isolators that were in uh, rooms and they were giving uh, medium rest dating to those things, thinking that that, that was a, a more robust environment. Um, that is no longer the case. If you have a glove box or an isolator in a uh, segregated compounding area, you have uh, limited BUDs and uh, that those are category one CSPs only. And I'll actually go into um, the next slide, which talks about those categories. Um, thank you. And this is uh, obviously just copied straight from the chapter, um, but I didn't feel the need to recreate something that seems fairly clearly communicated in the chapter. So those category one CSPs um, are really, it's based on where the products are mixed, not so much the complexity or how many packages. Um, there's a little bit of uh, more language about that in the chapter, but I just wanted to highlight here that um, that category ones can be prepared in an SCA or a clean room suite. Um, the addition of a refrigeration temperature of 24 hour BUD is a nice thing. Um, previously it was just limited to 12 hour BUD period um, if you were in an SCA. So it does give you a little bit more flexibility now with the um, a refrigerated temperature could maybe allow for a little bit more anticipatory compounding, um, but certainly not full scale batching that uh, maybe folks had been doing. And then in table 11 here, um, outlining the BUD criteria for category two CSPs and where that's outlined there. I think most health systems are probably, uh, or infusion centers are probably um, not doing any additional sterility testing and compounding from sterile components. So your room temperature BUD is four days, uh, which used to be 30 hours. So that's kind of nice. Uh, if you were at a medium risk kind of uh, practice or 48 if you were doing low risk. 
and uh, refrigerated as uh, now at 10 days, uh, which it was at nine days prior, or 14 days if you were doing low risk compounding. So it's kind of a, a compromise on those two. Uh, no change to the frozen uh, BUDs. All right, next slide. Uh, so environmental monitoring is, uh, there's some changes to this as well. Um, I think they really called out um, the importance of continuous pressure monitoring as well as temperature and humidity. And um, those have been part of uh, good compounding practices and other parts of uh, USP that outline storage recommendations, excuse me. Um, and uh, whether you use a continuous monitoring device or not, you have to at least record the pressures, temperatures, and humidity daily. Uh, I wanted to also highlight that you need to have corrective action plans uh, or, or procedures ready if you have excursions of temperature, humidity, or pressure. Um, uh, that I know has happened at the organizations I've worked with, uh, that if your temperature goes out of range for a little bit, you really need to think about the impact uh, that can have on your uh, product, not just the ones that you've compounded, uh, but also the, the uh, components that are, are waiting to be compounded, as well as, of course, for the comfort of our staff. Um, for uh, certification of classified areas, um, so classified area is defined as, as something with an ISO classification. So your hoods are ISO 5, uh, your buffer rooms are ISO 7, or, and then your ante rooms are ISO 7 or 8. Uh, so those areas need to um, be certified and have some uh, airborne uh, particle testing and sampling every six months. Um, that's usually completed by a certification vendor. Um, that hasn't changed, um, but what is, is new is a further definition of the surface sampling requirements, which is now defined as monthly. Um, prior to this revision, it was defined just very vaguely as periodically. So that could mean monthly, it could mean every quarter or every six months uh, that was also performed by your vendor. Uh, so I think this is really a new um, burden on um, hospitals and uh, different providers that you really have to have a sampling plan that uh, covers all of your classified areas. I do want to point out if you are a segregated compounding area, the only place that would need to be sampled technically would be the hood itself. Uh, it would be good practice to sample other areas, but you're also likely to find uh, other things when, you're, when you sample those areas because they're not controlled. Uh, and then another important clarification is when you have those samples uh, that the, there are now dual phase incubation standards. Um, so that is two different sets of temperature ranges and uh, time periods, and those are defined clearly in the chapter. Um, and that is to look for both bacterial and fungal growth. Um, in the prior version, uh, fungal sampling uh, and incubation times were only required uh, for high-risk compounding, uh, and now that's required for every place that you're doing sampling. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense uh, where that's coming from. We all know uh, with the New England compounding uh, disaster that there, there were lots of risks involved with that. Um, so it's important to look for, for any type of, of growth that could compromise your product. Um, and then just a note about the action levels. So once you do uh, incubate those samples, what you're looking for, um, the CFU counts remain the same, um, it, but there is now no longer a requirement to identify the microorganisms unless those levels are exceeded. So let's say you have, um, you know, 10 CFUs on a, a surface sample from your uh, cart in your ante room. Um, that might not be a big deal because I think the threshold is 50 for a, an ISO 8 anteroom area. Um, still, you want to track and trend those results over time, and um, if they're, you're, you're seeing continued increases or changes in your, your growth patterns, uh, that's something definitely to investigate. And um, I think the, imp the important thing is that they've removed the language of having potentially highly pathogenic bacteria. Um, I know the, the team that I worked with got really 
caught up because we, we had to investigate and do a corrective action plan when we found one CFU of, of other fungi that just was a random spore that was, grow, that was floating through the air. Um, it created a lot of effort for uh, not really much uh, problem solving that we could do. Um, you still do want to have a corrective action plan, though, regardless of what your findings are, and as I mentioned, tracking and trending those results over time. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so also on the personnel monitoring side um, and competency, they further defined what is expected for uh, training and competency. Uh, so uh, clearly initial testing and then every 12 months. Uh, the new requirement now is uh, media fill and glove fingertip and thumb sampling initially and every six months. Uh, so most organizations that I know of have just done that uh, in, as an annual requirement. So with the media fill and glove fingertip sampling, that's now increasing, you know, at least doubling your sampling requirement. Um, those incubation standards apply to the media fill and personnel sampling as well. Um, those are outlined in the chapter. A little bit different incubation time points depending on the media that you use. Um, I thought it was also interesting that they identified training and demonstration required for other personnel that may be in your um, IV rooms. Um, so that could be housekeeping staff, it could be facilities, um, maybe you have some non-compounding staff that are helping to do with cleaning or stocking of, of um, supplies and things. Uh, they also have a responsibility uh, to be following the procedures for hand hygiene and garbing um, so that you're not introducing further uh, contaminants into your, your workspace. Um, however, this frequency of training uh, and demonstration is really defined by your organizational uh, SOPs and that oversight is by the designated compounding su supervisor um, as are all the components of the chapter. Um, but that is not defined as an annual particular requirement. Uh, next slide. Okay, that, there's, there's still a lot of 797 that I didn't touch on. Um, there's a lot of things that hopefully people have been working towards with the current chapter, even though it's been out for a long time. Um, so I'm sure that there's still more, but in the interest of time, I also want to make sure we cover 795 uh, as, as we can and then get on to the rest of our content. Um, so, uh, also, that, as I mentioned with 797, that the, the chapter has been kind of reorganized and it really mirrors the format of 797 and 800. Um, pretty clearly in scope is any alteration of a, a drug or substance that's beyond the manufacturer's labeling. This really applies to those oral and topical dosage forms, um, especially things like that. Uh, and then out of scope are, again, radiopharmaceuticals, administration, um, reconstitution, which I think is an important point. Um, so think of all those antibiotic suspensions that are, you know, powders that need to be reconstituted. That's fairly straightforward and just following the manufacturer's uh, instructions on that. Um, repackaging, so maybe taking, maybe creating blister packs of things, uh, bubble packs, not in scope. Uh, splitting tablets, not in scope as well. And then as with 797, the hazardous drug reference, uh, points in 795 points you to uh, 800 and 800 reflects back to 795. All right, next slide. So facilities, I uh, want to highlight, highlight this because uh, this also could have um, potential impact for um, design or capital. Um, no HVAC requirements for non-sterile compounding, um, but you do need to have a designated area for non-sterile compounding. And so, um, the examples that they provide uh, says that it, 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 it doesn't need to be a room necessarily. It needs to have a defined, uh, perhaps a perimeter uh, or a, a clear space where non-sterile compounding happens. Um, it needs to have cleanable surfaces, uh, no carpet. Um, and I think the, the point of all this is you really want to minimize cross-contamination um, from general work practices or other things that are happening, um, as well as just kind of have an area to focus uh, while you're, you're doing this uh, practice. Um, also calls out the requirement for temperature monitoring, um, which if you're just in a 
uh, this is you have a, a corner of your pharmacy that you're doing this work in. Maybe it's just regular room temperature, but they want you to pay attention to that. Uh, again, and then having a sink accessible and clean. Uh, this should be fairly common sense, but I know that I've seen plenty of, um, I'll call them quote unquote compounding kitchens uh, that you know the dishes, your, your mortar and pestle or your supplies kind of um, end up piling up in the sink kind of like they do at home. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's what USP is really looking for. They're looking for clean and tidy places. Um, from an equipment standpoint, uh, they do really uh, recommend closed system processing devices um, such as uh, containment ventilated enclosures, biologic safety cabinets, or single-use glove bags. Uh, but the need for those is really based at the entity level and um, probably more based on how much compounding you're doing, the type of, of products, whether you're using bulk substances or um, commercially available substances. And then, of course, if you select or decide that you need to have a, a equipment like that, then you need to have SOPs for its uh, maintenance, calibration, certification, cleaning, um, and it does call out that they need to be certified every 12 months. And I believe the CETA testing board has been working on some certification standards for uh, these type of, of uh, enclosures. Uh, and I mentioned cleaning SOPs. Uh, so this is kind of heading in the direction of 797, if it sounds familiar. It's part of why I wanted to cover 797 first. All right, next slide. Uh, so similarly, um, in 795 for the non-sterile compounding, they've eliminated the categories of compounded products um, that previously had been related to complexity and now um, have made it uh, pretty straightforward um, that it's, it's based on the type of preparation and then the BUDs are um, derived from that. Um, notably, they did add a little more uh, requirement for um, if you want to use BUDs beyond what is stated in the table there. Um, you really need to have solid uh, references and resources that uh, meet this criteria. Um, as I was looking on the um, one site earlier this week, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. Um, this, this could potentially have an impact if, um, if your, your reference for compounding whatever recipe um, is, is pretty old and doesn't necessarily meet the standard. So that's something I would recommend um, you take a look at is if you have a, a pretty robust uh, recipe collection that you check out what resources and references and make sure that they meet the standard. Next slide. Uh, and then, of course, policies and procedures. Um, they call out that uh, you need to have policies and procedures for training and demonstration of uh, core competencies that are listed in the chapter um, for staff every 12 months. Uh, this, is, this is a good practice to have, and some folks may have already been heading this direction, um, but perhaps not. Um, and interestingly, I called out hand hygiene, hand hygiene and garbing as one of those core competencies. Again, hand washing you'd think would be a fairly uh, common thing, uh, but you never know. Um, and then uh, called out that gloves are required in personal protective equipment, um, but any additional uh, PPE such as gowns or uh, face shields or uh, masks would be based on your entity SOP and uh, a risk assessment. And then uh, I think this is, fairly interesting that they have a, a defined cleaning and sanitizing uh, schedule for the various uh, components of your designated compounding area. Um, so the work surfaces, um, so counters, hoods, things like that would need to be cleaned uh, at the beginning and end of each shift um, in between compounds of uh, different types, which that makes pretty good sense. Um, cleaning the floors each day, uh, walls, ceilings, and storage shelving, uh, sorry, walls and storage shelving every three months uh, or when, when noted, and then ceilings uh, when visibly soiled. Um, so again, thinking of your, your corner of the pharmacy where this is happening uh, may not get a lot of cleaning attention, so um, having a, a clearly defined expectation for that, um, when that's going to happen, who it's gonna, uh, who's going to do the cleaning, uh, something that you may need to develop an SOP for. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so I'm um, just kind of bringing 795, 797, and 800 all together. I said we weren't going to talk too much about 800, but um, all of them require obviously a very robust set of policies and procedures. Um, I can't say it enough that you, you need to document what you're doing, what you expect your staff to be doing, who's going to do it, how often it's going to be done, and, uh, and really stick to that. Um, a newer requirement, or how they've, they've provided clear language now in both, um, both the chapters, is for master formulation records and compounding records. Um, so the master formulation record describes the procedures for preparation, the um, anticipated beyond use date, any refer references to support that. Uh, and this is for non-sterile compounding, fairly common practice. Um, for sterile compounding, this is probably more for your batch preparation. So this is anything um, beyond the um, single anticipatory dose um, for a patient. So um, batches of um, antibiotics, things like that, you need to have a, a, a master formulation record. And then the compounding record uh, documents the steps and the components used. And for the most part, uh, your label uh, that you're uh, applying to your, your final product should meet this standard. Um, but please look at, there's, there's quite a few bullets under that uh, table in the chapter, both 795 and 797, and there's a little bit of differentiation between the two chapters. Um, so please look at that to make sure that you're meeting that standard. Um, as described in all of the chapters, uh, you need to have a designated person that is responsible for compliance with all aspects of each chapter. Um, that could certainly be one person that is, uh, is overseeing 795, 797, and 800. Um, or it could be a person that's responsible just for one of those. Um, it could also be a committee, uh, but if it's multiple people, you need to uh, define the roles and responsibilities of, of that, uh, that group. And then that, that group or person also needs to really have a, a handle on your quality assurance and quality control plan, making sure that all of those policies and procedures you developed um, are being adhered to, um, whether that's through auditing or um, uh, uh, site visits or uh, things like that, um, need to have a, a plan to keep those in line. Um, also calls out that you need to have um, a plan for prevention and detection of errors and other quality problems uh, and a way to evaluate complaints and adverse events, um, which most hospital systems have uh, a, a patient complaint and an adverse reaction uh, or medication error type reporting system, so we'll probably meet that requirement. Um, and then, as I mentioned, especially related to um, facility issues and environmental monitoring, you need to have a, a plan for investigating and um, having corrective actions if anything goes outside of your, your state of control. Um, all right, next slide. Great. So that was that was a lot to cover, and like as I mentioned, there's still a lot that that could be covered. Um, but I just want to highlight a few of the resources that um, Premier has to support you in uh, your road to compliance. Um, go ahead, show me. Um, so we've got. Um, we want to help you get ready and stay ready. Uh, we have general advice and updates. So we've had a couple of blog posts. We have webinars like this. Um, we also have subject matter experts, so myself and Chris and Jennifer um, and several other folks on our team that are available to serve as resources. Um, some, maybe you just have a, a, a question that you want to say, hey, are we on the right track? Um, or you know, there's frequently asked questions that come up. We can be there to help, um, help answer those on kind of an ad hoc basis. Um, We've also created some preparation checklists that are, um, hopefully are really helpful one or two page quick reference tool to help you hone in on the things that you really need to be thinking about for readiness. Uh, and those are, the link to those are going to be posted, um, I think, at the, the end of our slide set here and are on our Premier Inc. website. And then consulting services uh, is something that both Jennifer and I provide. Um, and that could be a full gap analysis on 795, 797, 800, um, or it could be um, just one of the, those three or whatever you need. Um, we can also help uh, with policies and procedure development, um, training. And remember um, on the USP 800 side, um, 
training could also include nursing staff, uh, certainly many folks beyond the pharmacy that need to know their risk of hazardous drugs. Um, and then if you're already further on your path in um, compliance, so getting ready, um, maybe you want somebody to come in and help validate where you're at. So we could do a, a mock survey to um, check against the different standards and um, help make sure you're on the right track. Um, I think that's it. What's our next slide? Oh, this just sort of shows that visual. All of those things can work together. Um, we're here to support our members and, um, and friends in whatever way they need. Um, and if there's something else that you need, please ask and we will find a way to meet your needs. We're in this together. All right, next slide. All right, I'm going to hand it over to my good friend Chris Jones who's on our uh, contracting team and he's going to give us an uh, update of other services that we have. Thanks, Annie, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on this very timely topic. Um, over the next couple of moments, I'm just going to go through what we currently have on contract to help you become compliant with these standards. Uh, again, it's not an all-inclusive list, but uh, hopefully you'll get a flavor for, for what we can do for you. Um, as Annie mentioned, we know that uh, personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, the consumables that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to keep the clean room clean, to keep your people safe, to meet all these standards are required. Uh, we have a couple of suppliers on contract at this point. Uh, contact Inc. is kind of a household name. They probably have 60% of the market share. Uh, Acute Care Pharmaceuticals is also out there, and they fill in a nice gap in the fact that they have some things that Contact doesn't have, but also make a lot of those same supplies. And uh, I want to also make sure it's clear to everyone that uh, Premier owns S2S Global, and S2S Global is an uh, American manufacturer, and they are capable of making a lot of these things, such as the protective equipment uh, as it relates to gloves and gowns and masks and things like that. So several options to choose from. This would include, but not be limited to, like I said, the PPE. It would include the cleaning supplies, the pre-soaked wipes, uh, the dry wipes, uh, the uh, Anything you would use like the mop handles, disposables that you, that you use in the day-to-day -day operation of a clean room, um, the disinfectant, the sporocytals, all these things that are now required in the general uh, chapter to make sure that you're doing. And not the least of which of those is uh, now that we're going to be doing, required to do more testing, the media fill kits, um, the chemo spill kits, things like that. So the auger plates that you need to actually do the fingertip testing and the uh, sample wiping and all of that are, are available on contract today, uh, right down to what you would need to clean the walls, the floors, the ceilings to, to keep everything within compliance. These providers have been with us for some time, and as you would imagine, we've seen quite a ramp up. I will say that I, I think both of them are an untapped source sometimes. The members uh, don't realize if you go to Contact's website or Acute Cares, they have videos of how to use their products, the appropriate way to clean a laminar flow hood uh, versus a, a containment hood, et cetera. So um, use those free resources to your advantage. They've, they've both propped up very good websites that could uh, be of value in additional training or just assisting in what you're doing on site. So next slide, please. So of course, the primary engineering controls that you're going to need to be in compliance are big capital equipment purchases, but those are on contract. We presently have the Baker Company and New Air, and those two companies make up about 65% of the market share in these categories. And it's everything you'd expect in terms of whether it's a laminar flow, whether it's a compounding aseptic isolator, or a containment isolator in the use of uh, uh, dealing with hazardous materials. Uh, all of these are available on contract today. Um, I think some of the key considerations when you're looking at this is what sizes do they come in, uh, what's going to fit the needs for your current clean room space, uh, what kind of warranties and service guarantees that we've put into the contracts that are very strong on your behalf so that you know you get service after the sale and that the equipment is warranted in a way that you don't have to worry. Um, and then, of course, uh, all the accessories that are required to help you meet compliance and get everything the way you need them to be. I'll also say this is probably not the best slide to mention it, but it's where it's a, a brain tickler for me with New Air, 
is they also make incubators that are the dual phase incubators that Annie described previously. So if you are going to be doing your own plating and monitoring, then uh, certainly they have those available for you. I know some folks would prefer to outsource that, and that's more of a lab function technology. But if uh, you decide to do that yourself, we certainly have those available and on contract today. As well as from a 795 perspective, we do have the containment ventilated enclosures. If you're going to be weighing out raw powders and need to uh, work with those, those are currently on contract as well. So next slide, please show me. Again, in the capital equipment arena, we have to have medical grade refrigerators and freezers. Those are available. We have the ones that have pass-through capabilities. Those are with Helmer and with Norlake. We also have a couple of other suppliers on the facility side of Premier, which would include Folet and uh, Fisher Scientific, so, there, so you have multiples to choose from. Uh, I know that the lab also uses uh, Helmer, and um, they've been one of our top suppliers for a number of years. Um, as we've mentioned before, we have to monitor temperatures. You have to monitor the temperature for the incubator, the temperature for the refrigerators and freezers, uh, temperatures in your clean room, humidities, pressure changes. We have various suppliers on contract that can offer you that kind of connectivity. And the nice part about that is you're not going back to the days of writing a number down on a sheet of paper and hoping that everybody complies. Uh, you get real-time alerts if anything goes out of range. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I think you're going to see uh, enforced in, in the very near future because you can see that the standard is moving more towards a good manufacturing type environment. So the expectation for environmental monitoring is moving in that way as well. So again, measuring those pressure differentials as you go from one ISO qualified room to the other, et cetera, all of that has to be done and all of that is available to you today. On the next slide, as Annie mentioned, you know, there are opportunities to um, look at ways to standardize the way we do our workflow. And if you want to work that into your standard operating procedures, we do have uh, devices today that either work through camera technology and or gravimetrics to allow you to uh, monitor the work of someone in the clean room without having to gown and garb and go in to take real-time photos of what they're doing and not just the syringe pulled back, but to see that 10 cc's actually was administered from one vial into this bag. Uh, so we have Baxter's Dose Edge, and on the OmniSoft side, we have IVSoft. For those of you who are looking to um, bring uh, a higher level of automation and technology into your clean room, because obviously there's more work, and you're probably going to have the, the personnel doing the cleaning and the environmental monitoring and all of those things, uh, if you're looking for hitting that uh, point where you could automate some of the, the processes, we do have compounding robotic systems on contract. Uh, the IV station for non-hazardous compounding from OmniCell and the IV station Onco for hazardous compounding. We are in the process right now. Um, our Exium came through in a breakthrough technology. They have what they're calling a CGMP compliant robot. If you wanted to consider opening your own 503B operation and adding this technology, it would stand up to that. It's just, again, a volume control issue, but the Reva robot will be coming on contract in the next couple of months. Uh, not all of their robots, just the one that's the CGMP compliant. But again, this is just some additional hardware and software that could allow you to be more efficient or add a level of safety beyond what's required in the standards. So next slide. As was already mentioned by Annie, uh, the certifications are going to continue to be something that's required at least every six months from an airborne particle testing and a viable airborne particle sampling. So having those solutions on uh, contract are important. So we do have MTA and TSS. Uh, they are service technicians who come in and do your air quality monitoring. They monitor things such as your uh, air changes per hour. Uh, for your HVAC and your primary engineering control. They'll do smoke studies and get the video of that to show you that the airflow air is unidirectional the way it should be. Um, and so that some of this you can buy some of the equipment yourself, but in terms of having some, a third party come in and certify uh, these two, uh, between the two, cover the entire country. You may find other providers who are local. 
uh, that they will be able to offer the same uh, level of support. It's just uh, these contracts have been pre-negotiated on your behalf. We have good terms. We have good identification. We require them to be licensed, bonded, insured, et cetera, so that you know that the person coming in there uh, will be held accountable for, for the tests that they do. Uh, next slide, please. From a clean room planning and design perspective, as Annie mentioned, we have uh, resources here uh, at Premier who can help you with the gap analysis uh, and, and help you decide. And if there is a need to change your physical environment, we do have two contractors uh, that are uh, vetted by Premier, Aseptic Enclosures, who's out of St. Louis, Missouri, and Carter Health, who's out of Florida. Uh, both of these companies can uh, fit a clean room into existing space. They can retrofit your current clean room or they can build out a clean room um, you know, from scratch in an uh, open shell environment. Uh, they also can add pass-throughs, anti-rooms, buffer rooms, whatever you need to bring your current situation into compliance. They will come on site and do the before and after analysis and give you the quote for what it's going to cost to get you there if you need to bring something up to speed. And uh, we also, from B. Braun Caps, uh, they offer a uh, what's called 797 and 800 ready check and they have a service where they will come in and help you write a business proposal to use with your administration to, to get to this next stage of what we need to do to uh, bring in uh, providers such as these to do the clean room modifications and, and architecture that needs to be done. And that includes HVAC and everything. Uh, it's, it's, it's turnkey with both of these suppliers. Uh, next slide, please. So we realize that at the end of the day, 797, 800, 795 are in, going to really impact how you operate on a day-to-day -day basis. But we'd be remiss not to take a moment and say we know that uh, outsourced compounding is going to still be there. As of just last week, uh, our measurements said that in the aggregate, Premier is sending about 125 doses per day to 503B compounders, and that's before. 797 revisions and 800 go live. We only anticipate that number going up. And with that being the case, we wanted to make sure we were, you were aware that these suppliers have recently been vetted, that this is a category that just got renewed starting January 1. We do have supplier, a national supplier now for interstitial pain pump refills. They operate at a 503B level, although it's a 503A operation, that's AIL's healthcare. Um, certainly, we still have caps on contract for TPNs, other 503 admixtures, and 503B. And then you see a laundry list there of others who can either do 503B ophthalmic products, 503B drug shortage items, or your traditionally used 503B items such as OR syringes, uh, various uh, on-Q pumps, uh, CAD pumps, whatever the case might be. Um, some of these things, as you know, with the changes that are going on, on 503A as well as USP, um, it's going to be difficult to do some of that anticipatory compounding yourself. Um, all the BUD dating and other things you would have to do, it's just going to make sense probably to outsource it. So I didn't want to leave that out and certainly I'm available uh, if you need assistance in understanding who offers what and uh, you know which suppliers are, are currently uh, available for you and so all of these are currently on contract and in good standing with the FDA and we're working with them uh, to continue to look at who else is out there. So on the next slide, I just wanted to pause there. I think we have roughly 10 minutes uh, left and so I wanted to give ample time for any questions and answers, but thank you for your time and attention today and I'll turn it back over to the operator and to show me. Great, thank you Annie and Chris. So we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A session right now. As a friendly reminder, you can always go ahead and type in your question into the bottom left corner of the chat box, and I will read your question out loud. Or to ask your question verbally, I'm going to turn things over to Melody to review the prompts for doing so. Thank you. Participants can register for a phone question by pressing the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-toned prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question is answered and you want to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. Again, to register for an audio question, that would be the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad. I'll turn it back to you for any chat questions. 
Great, thanks Melody. So Annie and Chris, we do have several questions that have already come in via the chat, so I'll go ahead and get started with these. So the first question is regarding continuous daily documentation of pressure, temperature, and humidity. This individual is asking whether electronic monitoring, which records data every hour, is sufficient to meet the new standards. Uh, this is Annie. Yes, I, I believe that is um, sufficient, and it, it actually does call that out in the chapter that continuous monitoring is acceptable. Um, the point is that those records are retrievable and that someone is still reviewing that things are still in range. So even if that's a quick, you know, looking on the wall and making a check mark that it's in range or documenting the temperature or the humidity, um, the, you still want to monitor it and not just trust that those systems are, are functioning as they should be. Um, and uh, when a surveyor perhaps comes in and says, show me your temperature records for the last three months, uh, you need to have a way to do that. And I know a lot of organizations that's maintained by the facilities department, um, so you got to have a, a good relationship with them and have those uh, that data readily accessible. Great. Another question is regarding cleaning of the ISO 5 and ISO 78 clean rooms. Can housekeeping or environmental services continue to do the cleaning, or must a pharmacy technician perform the cleaning moving forward? Um, I, I think that is uh, up to your comfort level at the organization um, and what your confidence is in the training and competency of those staff. Uh, if uh, you feel more comfortable with pharmacy level staff doing that work, I know a lot of organizations have, have gone that way. There's, there's no um, hard line that I saw in the chapter that, that prohibited um, other ancillary services providing that. The, the key is competency and demonstration and ongoing uh, tracking of that. Okay. Our next question is something that Annie, both you and Chris have um, already alluded to, but it relates to environmental services and how it appears that they're going to have a larger role moving forward. Can you comment on that? Um, I think I would ask for a little clarification on environmental services. Is that if, uh, if that's about housekeeping type of services like we just described. Um, it's certainly important that they are aware of what the standards are. Um, the cleaning standards for 797, the frequency, that hasn't really changed. Um, but as I highlighted in 795, um, you know, that, that, that might be a, a lesser used corner of your pharmacy. You want to make sure that those things are getting, um, areas are getting cleaned on an appropriate schedule. Um, if we're talking more about facilities and engineering um, from an uh, environment of care standpoint, um, they absolutely need to be um, partnered with you and the pharmacy to understand the impacts of any changes to um, pressures or air changes or um, any when you're, when you're working on some other area of the facility and how that could imp impact your pharmacy airflow. Um, they, they need to have a good, solid understanding of these requirements and um, be, be best friends with you in terms of any changes that might be coming. And when it comes to maintenance of those um, HVAC units and things like that, they, they are usually in charge of it. So um, again, need to be partnered together in, in that process. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second and see, Melody, if there are any questions that have come in through the phone. Yes, we do. And as a reminder, to register for a phone question, that is 1-4 on your telephone. Our question comes from the line of Larry Schiller. Your line is all open. Please proceed. My question is in regards to allergen extracts. I uh, just want to confirm, is it being covered under 795 or 797? That's the easy question. The next part of it <laughs> deals with um, uh, how we go about uh, compliance issues with allergen extracts. I have a pediatric clinic, and most of the allergen extracts already uh, come packaged by the manufacturer. That's fine, but many of them require dilution, 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to 1,000, uh, et cetera. And we have our pediatricians that actually carry that out at the pediatric clinic. Is that going to be a problem with compliance? 
Uh, thank you for your question, Larry. Um, the, yes, so the easy answer is yes, allogeneic extracts are covered under 797. Uh, there is, they have their own section kind of at the end of the chapter. Um, and I apologize, I don't have the chapter right in front of me um, to answer more specifically the criteria around that. Um, that there are some um, additional um, provisions given for, for beyond use dating. Um, but I would direct you back to the chapter to look really clearly about who or where um, that type of compounding is allowed to happen. And uh, it may be that if it, if it can happen outside of uh, a clean room setting, that again, competency and uh, just needs to be documented. And I'm sure that would be a really fun endeavor with your pediatricians. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We have no further questions at this time on the phones. Okay, we have plenty on the chat box though. So, <laughs> um, what sporicidal agent would you, would you recommend that is the least toxic to IV <laughs> personnel? Uh, that there, there's no such thing. Um, and I, I'm sure you're alluding to some of the, the smells um, or, things that can um, really be irritating to staff. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a, a wonderful product that meets the sporocidal requirements um, that also doesn't, doesn't smell nasty or have some, some um, difficult effects. Um, so other recommendations I have for that uh, are try and, and rotate the um, when those things happen or have it uh, happen at a time where there are fewer staff involved, um, rotate who does it so there's less impact to um, the, you know, a single staff person. Um, there are some masks and things that you can wear um, to help filter out some of that, um, those particles and, and things that are so irritating. Um, uh, one thing I didn't uh, mention but now it calls to my uh, memory is that there is a now a requirement for monthly use of sporocytals um, in your, so your monthly cleaning. Um, if you weren't doing sporocytal cleaning for the entire clean room suite, um, that will now be required. So that impact might get, um, might increase. Okay. So I will say that there are several more questions to go, but we do recognize that we are at the end of the hour. So we're going to continue to go through these questions and we'll have Annie and Chris reach out to folks individually with responses. But I can also answer two of the most commonly asked questions um, in the next couple slides. So one, where do you go for resources? On this slide, we've linked to direct resources where you can get the preparation list that Annie alluded to earlier on 795, 797, and 800. All of the GPO contracts that Chris referred to are available at this link. And if you are at a non-acute site of practice, we have a website that is dedicated specifically to you. Annie, Jennifer, and Chris's information is also linked here, as well as mine. Um, just because these revisions are final doesn't mean that we don't continue to gather information regarding what is working, what is not working, and what needs to be changed in the future. We're also constantly looking for any reports of concerns as it relates to patient safety. So for example, are these requirements really onerous and are you seeing an increased push to bedside compounding, for example, that perhaps may not be in the best interest of patient care? And then for general increase about anything and everything Premier related, we also wanted to make sure that you knew that you could reach out to the Solutions Center at any time. And I'd also just like to remind everybody of Annie and Chris's contact information as well as Jennifer's that's available here for you. Um, at the end of today's presentation, there will be a post survey where we're going to ask you a few questions about how we did and how we can further help you in this area. One question that's already been asked is, will there be a webinar on USP 800? And ironically, that's one of the questions that you'll see in the post survey about if that's something that would be beneficial for our members. So with that, I'd like to conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank Annie and Chris for their expertise in helping us present this information today. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.